Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Thanks so much. Um, hey, everyone. So I'm wondering, how many people here have heard of Estonia? Show of hands. OK. How many people here have been to Estonia? Wow, not bad. OK, I have not yet been. So Estonia is a Baltic nation with 1.3 million people. In the tech world, they're best known as the home of the developers that came up with Skype. But actually, they're soon to be known for a lot more because Estonia recently announced that it's teaching all first graders how to code. So by comparison, Estonia is double, more than double actually, the population of Las Vegas. But what the people of Estonia realized was that learning how to code, particularly at a very young age, is the key to technological innovation. In the US right now, less than 5% of high schools actually um, have CS. So students aren't learning how to code. In many cases, the best software developers and engineers are people that started at, say, the age of five or six. Maybe they had a parent who was in technology. I have a friend whose dad was a NASA engineer. But this is of extreme importance. So actually, course offerings have gone down in the US and not up. Um, APCS went down 35% between 2005 and 2009. Other courses down 17%. Things are not going in the direction that we needed to go as a nation and we have not prioritized CS education. So what does this mean? Does everyone have to be a professional programmer? No. Learning how to code at an early age can teach things like computational thinking, breaking down complex problems and solving them, and building things that are actually tangible. So last night I was at the Tech Jelly here in Vegas and met a kid named Ethan, 12 years old. He had come up with an app, I believe it was called Lazy Husband, uh, using PhoneGap, and people know that technology. And he had told me, oh yeah, you know, I spent a few hours learning CSS, did some JavaScript online, and here he is building apps. This is the future of Las Vegas. So what does this mean? This means that there's a huge opportunity in engaging people at a very early age to learn these skills. It also means that there's an opportunity you don't need to be five to learn. Anybody at any age can learn these skills. Paul Graham, founder of Y Combinator, recently wrote an essay on Startup ideas. How many do people here read it? Anyone? So his thesis is the best way to come up with good startup ideas is to live in the future and build what's missing. Estonia is living in the future. He also says that if something seems obvious to you, that means it's probably a good idea if you're living in the future. And that if it's too late, don't worry. If you're living in the future, you'll be fine. So I would encourage everyone here in Vegas to also start living in the future and there's a significant need within our nation as well to prioritize CS education and learning how to code and technical skills. So as far as the future of education and learning, I see three major trends. The first is that there's going to be more and more knowledge online. Things are going online, not off. That's not to say that there isn't importance in online and offline interaction, um, and I've worked a lot on that, but by and large, things are going online. Secondly, the inertia is moving away from the system, not toward it. Again, there's a significant role for schools to play in all of this. For example, um, for leveling the playing field, some people's parents are engineers and they can learn, but not everyone has access to that. And the third is that the line between teachers and students is being increasingly blurred. There's a saying that uh, to teach is to learn twice. And actually, there's a huge amount of potential in things like peer-based learning. So I've taught at uh, Stanford and Yale, and actually in my class at Yale, I always had my students come up with projects. They had to design it, they actually had to work with groups, they had to put something online and release it to the world. The results, I have to say, were incredibly impressive. So I got a, an email a few weeks back from a former student of mine saying, hey, um, I have some legal questions. It turns out somebody wrote to me and wants to license and possibly acquire the website I built for your class. And I was like, hey, that's pretty awesome. He actually has a huge opportunity coming out of that. I've had students um, create videos and films that were viewed by tens of thousands of people and presented at conferences. My class was not a filmmaking class. That one was called Intellectual Property in the Digital Age. It was about remix culture. They had DJs, filmmakers, authors, so on and so forth. So the future of education is one in which it's project-based. It's engaging. 
it's one where people collaborate. Right now our educational system is so focused on the individual and not on the teamwork, but all of you know that in the real world, first of all, there's no exam for life. And second of all, you do not work alone. You have to collaborate with others. So secondly, a huge trend that we'll see in the future is one of peer-based learning. As Frank mentioned, I'm part of a community at Stanford called StartX. We are a peer-based entrepreneurial community. Um, it's not a top-down approach. We share knowledge within the community, and the benefit is that there's no one singular leader that we all look to. We all create and share our knowledge, and it's been incredibly successful. I believe we actually, after Y Combinator, and because we're a nonprofit, we do also have uh, companies that are in both, are um, the second best uh, accelerator when it comes to funding numbers. Now, granted, funding isn't everything, but folks are learning how to fundraise, they're building engaging products, and they're getting out there. And we've only been around for two years. So there's been a huge trend as well um, in something that's called MOOCs. Have people heard of MOOCs? I actually really don't like this acronym. Right, so massively open online course. MIT actually started this back um, over 10 years ago with their open courseware, where they put a whole lot of lectures, problem sets, exams online. And folks around the world use this often, say, in India and China. Professors and teachers use these resources, but it hadn't had the substantial impact that one would like. Then, a little bit over a year ago at Stanford, some professors decided to put their courses online and do so in a way that engaged people because it was uh, one semester long and they had assignments and it was kind of all at the same time, right? So I don't know if people heard about the AI class coming out of Stanford, but 180,000 students signed up. There are now several startups, um, Coursera, Udacity, Harvard and MIT came together to create edX. When I was a grad student at Harvard, uh, we bugged the administration to put courses online, but no, they were afraid that this could ruin the brand. Luckily, things now have changed. I wish that they had been more proactive in doing so. So we were seeing a whole ton of lectures going online and courses. Now at the same time, only about 7% of those people taking the courses complete them. And while I'm very happy that more and more information and knowledge is going online, to me, as my colleague John Lilly, a partner over at Greylock, uh, said, MOOCs are a revolution in distribution of content, but not in the way that people learn. If we just have people dropping knowledge on the masses, talking heads, he says, dropping knowledge on the masses, this is not the future of learning and education. So while I'm happy that that's all there, there's something significant that needs to happen in the form of getting people engaged, having peer-based learning, having people actually create and work on projects and do things that are meaningful. And one great thing, by the way, about coding and computer science is that it provides you with incredible tools. I was talking to a friend a few weeks ago about how the sheer number of tools now available to, say, a 10-year-old kid that wants to learn how to code is astounding compared to what we had even a decade or two ago. Along those lines, um, so I'm an advisor to a company called Code HS, based out of StartX, um, started by the two head TAs for all of Stanford Introductory CS. Uh, so they ran the 60 or so other TAs that helped students learn Intro CS at Stanford. They recently launched a crowdfunding campaign called CS and HS to teach uh, sorry 1,000 students how to code in U.S. high schools. So they're going out and they're looking to raise funding and they're getting in touch with schools and people have already said that this has changed their lives. There are lots of great coding resources out there, but they're providing real world help from the best TAs potentially in the world for this subject. So I encourage you to go check that out. Another thing I'm really passionate about is getting more diversity in technology. Um, so for example, there's a group called Code Ed, run by a friend of mine, Angie Schiavone and Sepp Conver out of Boston. They teach, I believe, middle school girls how to code in low income areas. So lots of girls of color. Um, they've seen these girls get incredibly engaged. It's an after school program. They're operating in SF, New York, and Boston now. And this has made a huge impact on those people's lives. So when it comes to the future that I'd like to see in education, it's one in which people aren't judged merely on the basis of a score or a grade or even a degree. People are judged on the basis of what they're capable of doing and what they can show people and what they've made. It's one in which you don't graduate and then you stop learning. You're never too old uh, to learn. For example, my grandfather always tells me how much he loves Wikipedia and reads about it. He doesn't consider himself a student, but he is engaged in learning, right? It's also a future in which 
you're never too young to learn something. So for example, computer science as a new form of literacy, people learning how to code when they learn how to read and write, or even neuroscience. Why do you have to wait to college to learn about the way the brain functions? Shouldn't kids learn about that too? And the future is one in which people are actively engaged, where teachers and students work together and people peer learn and they're able to create the future because the future that I want to see is the one that we all create. Thanks a lot. Thank you.